depending on what point of view you adopt, finance is fine. I mean, the Dow Jones and DAX, they're at all-time highs, and soon the NASDAQ, FTSE, and, and um, SMI will follow. And soon also the austerity measures will pay off and, well, everything will be great. Well, today I would like to argue that finance is broken on multiple levels and I would like to focus on psychology, complexity and meaning. So starting with psychology, ideology is an important issue. Well, remember an ideology is a conceptual framework with the way people deal with reality. Everyone has one to exist. You need an ideology. The question is whether it is accurate or not. So, fair enough. And if people realize that their ideology isn't working, well, that's an important first step. And what I am saying to you is, yes, I found a flaw. I was shocked because I'd been going for 40 years or more with very considerable evidence that my ideology was working exceptionally well. These words were spoken at a congressional hearing in 2008 by Alan Greenspan. <laughs> but not everyone can see past their ideology. I don't know what a credit bubble means. I don't even know what a bubble means. These words have become popular. I don't think they have any meaning. Now, Eugene Farmer is the father of the efficient market hypothesis. And the hallmark of the theory is that disputes the very existence of financial bubbles. But others have been more critical. In short, the belief in efficient financial markets blinded many, if not most, economists to the emergence of the biggest financial bubble in history. Now, ideology is only one issue. Another problem is related to moral hazards. Basically, a nice way to call fraud. The last mystery of the financial crisis. It's long been suspected that ratings agencies like Moody's and Standard & Poor's helped trigger the meltdown. A new trove of embarrassing documents shows how they did it. Well, the simple conflict of interest here is that don't bite the hand that feeds you. And then we had the LIBOR scandal. There are at least $350 trillion worth of assets worldwide pegged to the LIBOR. And for years, banks profited by routinely manipulating the rate. And who knows what other scandals are waiting to be uncovered. Finally, the last psychological problem I would like to talk about is overconfidence. But there is also a strong belief, which I share, that bad or rather oversimplistic and overconfident economics helped create the crisis. Now, this is from the chairman of the Financial Services Authority, not some anti-capitalist activist. And in the same vein, a quote by the governor of the European Central Bank. Macro models failed to predict the crisis and seemed incapable of explaining what was happening to the economy in a convincing manner. Okay, let's move on. So there's a whole new set of problems related to complexity. And one issue is the level of complexity, which can be too high or too low. To compute the LIBOR, banks are basically asked, at what rate would you borrow funds? As an example, the one-month US deal rate is calculated by surveying 18 banks, and the four lowest values and four highest values get discarded, and from the rest, an average is taken. I mean, don't get me wrong, I think spreadsheets are a great thing, but I would expect a bit more sophistication when we're talking about a reference value to which 350 trillion are tied to. And we can also have too much complexity. Bank of America disclosed on Monday that it had made a significant error in the way it calculates a crucial measure of its financial health, suffering another blow to its effort to shake its troubled history. The mistake, which had gone undetected for several years, led the bank to report recently that it had four billion more capital than it actually had. I mean, now you try doing something like that on your next tax return. <laughs> Complex derivatives. 
the intrinsic complexity of the financial derivatives market has emerged as both an incentive to engage in it and a key source of its inherent instability. Regulators now faced with the challenge of taming this beast may find inspiration in the budding science of complex systems. And talking of complex systems, systemic risk is a crucial notion here. So we now know that when networks get too connected, they become vulnerable because once a node experiences distress, the problem can spread like an epidemic through the network. Now, this is the core of the global ownership network we looked at in 2011. The most important shareholders are in it. And this high level of interconnectivity does not look good. So the problem we're looking at here is too connected to fail. Scaling laws are very simple probability distributions. If you plot them on a logarithmic scale, you get a straight line, as you can see by going from the left to the right panel. Now, essentially, a scaling law says that there are a few key players that are very important, whereas all the others don't really matter, like in this example. So, although there are a few important mega cities, actually, only medium and small towns exist, which aren't very influential. And scaling laws are everywhere. They show the emergence of order out of chaos. The size of earthquakes, solar flares, sand particle, computer files, price moves, the number of citations, web page hits, species in tax, so the sales of music and books, the air is burnt in forest fires, the frequency of words, the currents of surnames, all these things are distributed according to a scaling law. Now, things get a bit complicated when humans enter the picture because income and wealth is also distributed in such a way. So although this appears to be the signature of a universal self-organizational principle in nature, to most humans, it looks very undemocratic. Okay, moving on to meaning. As I see it, the economics profession went astray because economists as a group mistook beauty clad in impressive looking e equations for truth. Now, coming from theoretical physics, I was very impressed by the high level of abstraction seen in finance. Indeed, one of the panels is from string theory and the other is related to pricing a European option. But for me, the question always was, does this elaborate mathematical machinery actually link back to reality? And I find this is a legitimate question, both for string theory and for finance. And if you were wondering, the option pricing thing is seen on the right. There was a nice article in Wired magazine illustrating this problem. So there is this function called the Gaussian copula. And it became the gold standard for modeling complex correlated risk. Well, everything is fine unless an extreme event occurs, like a financial crisis, because then the model's assumptions break down and the tool becomes useless, even damaging. And another issue is spuriousness. <coughs> when is a signal real? This publication became, became quite famous because the authors had seen this universal organizational principle going on in complex systems. Well, Didier Sornet reproduced their study using purely random data. And they found, or he found, exactly the same patterns. This means that the methodology creates the signal and nothing new was observed. Now, Sernet submitted these findings to the same journal, and he got rejected, and very angry. As a co-author of the paper that you just rejected, I cannot remain silent and have to express my concern. Your policy implies that a fundamental error can remain published as truth. In other words, we can add garbage to the field, but we cannot correct and remove garbage from the field. I hope that any editor could realize 
the moral hazard and wrong incentives permeating more and more the sociology of science encouraged by editors such as you in a way analogous to a graft from the scandalous behaviors observed in the financial industry. Yeah, he was angry. Okay, let's look at some numbers. So, one green square is one US dollar. A thousand squares equal, uh, sorry, a thousand dollars equal an orange square, and so on to a million and a billion. And finally, we have a pale blue square, which is one trillion. And now we can look at some interesting statistics, like the world's GDP on the top left panel. And we can compare it to the total debt in the US, seen on the top right. <coughs> or we can look at the size of the derivatives market by year. And finally, we can visualize inequality. So the top 1% in the US get about 20 squares, whereas the lowest 50%, about one and a half. Now, this is estimated total economic production of the human race so far. Roughly 60% since 1980. So what does this mean? I mean, is this really related to some real tangible value? Or are these just virtual numbers in computers? In the end, a humongous bubble. So what about solutions? Well, I don't know. And I don't think anyone does, unless, of course, you prove me wrong. Now, this may sound a bit disappointing, but I really believe that we have created systems that we don't understand and cannot control yet. So the first place to start is to admit that there is a problem. And this is happening. This is an organization of 65 student associations from 30 countries. And they're basically saying, not only is the, the, the world's financial system in crisis, but the way we teach economics. And unfortunately, there are no silver bullets, regardless of what politicians would like to tell you. Now, I'm not trying to say we can't solve complicated problems in a complicated world. But the way we solve them is with humility and to actually use a problem-solving technique that works. Now, you show me a successful complex system, and I will show you a system that has evolved through trial and error. Now, Tim Harford is an economist, and he realizes that trial and error is a very powerful tool, but also not a very sexy idea to sell to politicians and other economists. And we need to move away from ideology, uh, ideology and start to do more data-driven and reality-based research. And, okay, I'm a bit biased on this one. We need to listen to the scientists. I would very much welcome inspiration from other disciplines. Physics, engineering, psychology, <coughs> biology. And why stop there? Compared to physics, it seems fair to say that the quantitative success of the economic sciences is disappointing. Classical economics is built on very strong assumptions. An economist once told me, these concepts are so strong that they supersede any empirical observation. Wow, really um, amazing. And Jean-Philippe Bouchot was one of the pioneers of econophysics. But his empirical research usually gets ignored by mainstream economists. More transparency and disclosure would help. Of course, great ideas, as long as you are not personally asked to do the disclosing. And we need to listen or get or have more or use the insights coming from complexity science and big data. Finance is a classic complex adaptive system. At least historically, finance has not thought of itself as a system. Now, Andy Haldane is the chief economist at the Bank of England. And what he's suggesting is nothing short of a massive paradigm shift. And it's ironic because the tools and complexity have been used in many other domains very successfully for quite some time now. 
Networks and rules of interaction. Interactions between agents are what matter. The key to that is to explore the underlying architecture of the network, not the behavior of a single node. Now, this is really very important because it means by changing the local rules of interaction, we can change the whole system from bottom up. For instance, if you would like to re-engineer the distribution of income and wealth. Financial networks key to understanding systemic risk, so yay. This is from an IMF conference only three years after our study appeared. And once we implement these things, we can do forecasting and start to do cool things like monitor the health of the financial system and detect upcoming storms like in meteorology. And what exactly was the purpose of finance, economics and banks in the first place anyway? And what about reality checks? And are GDP and stock market indices really the right numbers to look at when we're trying to assess the health of an economy? Now, this is a cast of an underground ant's nest. <coughs> Pictures actually on its head. Now, ants are the only species next to humans that have aircon. So there exists this one type of ant that builds these complex ventilation shafts. And these shafts ensure that the nest is at a constant temperature. Now, this is really important because these ants also cultivate a fungus which feeds them. And this fungus needs, needs a specific constant temperature to survive. I mean, if you take a single ant and look at it, I mean, there's not much in terms of intelligence going on there. Only as a superorganism is this amazing level of collective intelligence reached. I personally believe that there is no fundamental reason why the systems we humans engineer cannot also exhibit collective intelligence. You know, show behavior that is sustainable, adaptive, resilient. But for things to change, I believe we all have to ask ourselves, what is our relationship to money? And if it is conducive to happiness on a personal and on a collective level. Thank you. I don't know about you, but I've just been sent into an existential crisis here, James. Um, so if you were designing a new kind of university course mm -hmm. to produce a generation that's more aware or that's able to create a better system, yeah. how would you start out? What would you do as the building blocks of that course? I think we're actually already seeing this. That I mean, on the one hand, you have to use the data which is coming in. So that's why the disclosure thing, that there would be so, many, so much financial data which no one can use yet because it's not disclosed. So try and collect that use that on the one hand, and, and then use these tools which, which people have been using, I don't know, for 20 years or more in all different fields, very, kind of with a lot of success. So just kind of bring these different bits of the puzzle together. And I think uh, that is what's, what's slowly happening, that kind of this mainstream way of doing economics with kind of these idealized models and ideas that they're being replaced by this more kind of hands-on data complexity interaction picture. And uh, actually, I think that we can be positive that it's, it's starting to go in this direction only quite slowly. Optimism, that's what we need. <laughs> Thank you very much, James. Thank you.